Got it. All right. Let's move on to topic number two. Eight, four, six, five. No, that's not the last four of my social nor my ATM passcode. It's the amount of new undisputed champions in the four major promotions. The UFC had eight. Bellator had four. PFL had six. One championship. They had five. What gives? Do you find this exciting or do you like dynasties? Who do you think will be the next champion to fall? That would be my question to you all. And goes, you're going to lead things off. Man, this... I love the sport, man. This is what makes it so crazy. Anything can happen at any time. If you're the NFL, right, and you have your top team, you have them face lesser opponents, a lesser ranked team, nine out of ten times, they're probably going to win that matchup, right? But in MMA, it doesn't always happen that way. Aljamain Sterling, right? He's the Bantamweight champion in the UFC. If you take the 13th ranked guy, that's Adrian Yanez, he could give him a run for his money. That would be a decent fight. And that's what makes this all so interesting. So these belts, they get passed around, man. Like to say you're a champion is a big deal, but it kind of isn't. Like when you're in a room, if you were to take the entire UFC roster, put them all together, there are a lot of champions. And then there are a lot of people who have been champions. There would be a lot of people walking around going, I used to be a champion, right? So what's really going to make these people stand out in the history books, when we look back, are title defenses. That's where it's at, guys. Title defenses. Some of these fighters are so, so fast to go over and try and be a champ champ. And I think that they forget. I know they're chasing a little bit of money, but I think they forget that that's why we have guys like GSP and Anderson Silva that we talk so highly of. Because what they did in defending that title day in and day out was so impressive. And it's so hard to do. You see how many of these belts get passed around. It's very, very difficult. So I think it's crazy. Um, I think especially when you add in interim titles, I'm sure the fans have no idea what's going on at times, but I think it's kind of what makes things fun. So at the end of the day, man, uh, I don't know. I, I kind of dig it, but I kind of don't. But I'm more on the I dig it side because it gives you that anything can happen type feeling. Yeah, you're right about the title defenses because the other day when we were doing spinning back, like I think it was Fada that mentioned Valentina's on number seven. And I just thought, wow, like that literally is a legendary run a legendary career that she's built mm -hmm. and it, it it really stands out, you know? So but George, let me ask you this. You, we grew up in the same era, right? Remember Mike Tyson, how, how many people would be in our house to watch Mike Tyson fight? And a lot of people just wanted to see him fight. But a lot of people just wanted to see him lose. It had to happen at some point. Right. Do you feel any different in any of these title fights, less excited, more excited um, when it's a guy that's maybe defending for the second time or the third time or the first time? Like, I kind of feel just as pumped up, man. So I don't know. I really don't know. I celebrate their greatness and then either their personality gets me to be a bigger fan or they turn me off and then I just got to pay for the pay-per-view just to see them lose. Or maybe because I want to uh, witness it. You know, maybe I don't want to necessarily see them lose, but I want to witness it. I don't want to miss it. That's what used to happen with, with Mike Tyson. But uh, all right, let's get the next one here. Uh, Nolan, how about you, man? Yeah, I, I feel like I kind of... To me, that that phenomenon you just talked about was a big, you know, portion of my interest in getting into this sport was tuning in to see if somebody could beat Anderson Silva, tuning in to see if somebody could beat George St. Pierre, tuning in to see if somebody could beat John Jones, tuning in to see if somebody could beat Jose Aldo. There was that stretch of time where it was almost like every single division had a reigning champion that was just unbeatable or seemingly unbeatable or, you know, just that that was a cool era. And for me, we don't necessarily have that anymore. I think. Uh, part of that I attribute to just the sport as a whole getting better. And I also think that there's more athletes, the pool's bigger, there's more um, styles make fights, obviously. So there's kind of a, a round robin effect too, where I think more so now than ever, we see certain divisions where there's maybe, uh, you know, somebody in the top three, each person has the number stylistically of somebody else there. So there's, you know, maybe no clear front runner as to who the best fighter in that division. I mean, look at Look at Israel Adesanya, Alex Pereira, and Robert Whitaker right now. Like, Izzy's kind of got Rob's number, but somebody the other day was talking about what if Rob and Alex fought. And for me, I would probably lean towards Whitaker. So I, I think that there's uh, there's a number of different things that have changed over time that al doesn't allow for these champions to be as dominant. Um, you know, I think there were certain fighters that were ahead of their time. There were certain fighters that had figured out how to train at a level past the point of what they thought was what we thought was possible in MMA. So now that everybody's kind of competing, they have uh, they have 
equal access to things like the UFC Performance Institute. And there's so much science behind that goes on. And maybe the money, as much as fighter pay, isn't what we think it should be. It is better. It does allow for these people, these athletes to um, utilize the, these resources that weren't previously available. Um, I think there's a number of different reasons, but it is fascinating to see how the sports change in that regard. I don't know if it's good or bad or in between, but for me personally, having those dominant champions was something that I always appreciated. It always added an extra wrinkle of fun into the mix when it was it, it was mind blowing to see Anderson Silva go down. Um, you know, moments like that. So um, we'll see what happens. Maybe it's just the trend that the sports on for now. But I honestly, looking at how strong some of these divisions are, I think we're going to be talking about something similar in 2023. I remember being there, Nolan King. Ray Longo tells Chris Wyman, put a hole in his fucking chest. <laughs> of course, it was some lazy little left hand, I think, that clipped him, that got him. But, yeah, uh, thank you for taking me through memory lane. How about you, Mike Bond? Are you a dynasty guy, or do you like this little carousel of champs? I think it's a mixed bag, and that's what makes the sport so great. I mean, I think the the days of having multiple long-term champions are probably largely behind us. And the ones that are able to do it, that just shows why they're so special. I mean, I think Nolan and Goes hit it pretty well. Like the level of the sport is just rising to a point where it's so difficult to be able to beat these guys or girls night after night. The ones who are preparing a lifetime for that moment, you know, you are say like a Kamaro Usman, who's, you know, the latest long-term champion or Izzy who went down like, the opponents challenging them are preparing for them for how many years for that exact style. You know, Alex Perea knew he was probably going to fight Israel Adesanya at some point and probably had in the back of his mind for every training camp, for every training session, let's incorporate some things to take down the dominant champ. And then this champion only has maybe three, four months between fights to think about that next challenger because they're focusing on the previous best guy coming for their belt. So it's really, really difficult to maintain. And that's what makes these all-time greats, the John Jones, the you know Usmans, the GSPs, Jose Aldo, et cetera, et cetera, uh, makes them the legends and icons of our sport because it is just that difficult to do. And it's going to continue happening, in my opinion. I mean, you look at the weight classes, especially in the UFC right now, I actually was on like a year end similar kind of podcast with uh, Aaron Braunstetter for TSN and a few of the other notable journalists from other outlets. And we were told to give our predictions for the champion for each weight class at the end of 2023. And outside of like three of them, one of them being like Amanda Nunes at featherweight, which is, of course, like a lock. <laughs> like I didn't have extreme confidence. I was like, hey, it could be two, three guys. Can you tell me? who is going to be the light heavyweight champion at the end of 2023. There's like six potential options the way this thing is playing out. So uh, I think it's good for the sport in a lot of ways. Uh, we're not at the point of like boxing where you don't know, you know what title means what or who means where. Like the UFC belt still holds extreme significance. It's a huge, uh, you know, declaring factor, not just to prove who maybe the best guy in the moment is, but from a financial side as well, what that can bring you in terms of the pay-per-view buys, the sponsors, things like that. So yeah, these belts are as important as ever, in my opinion. And I think, uh, you know, seeing kind of just the mixed bag of people not holding the belts for long, people who are able to entrench themselves as long-term champions and what makes the sport what it is. And I think um, that's not going to go away. I can't imagine uh, we're getting to, a point where we're going to see, you know, five, six, seven long-term champions at once. There's going to be a lot of parody over and over. The Harlem Globetrotters are more likely to lose in 2023 to the Washington Generals than Amanda Nunes dropping that strap at featherweight. Um, all right. So, guys, the next three topics, our top three of the year, are more serious. So let's stay here for just a moment and have a little bit of fun. What champions lose in the first quarter of 2023? I'll give you a couple out there that are, are maybe layups uh, only because they're early part of the year, not disrespecting the champions. But as mentioned, Bader has Fedor coming up, right? Heavyweight champ over at Bellator. And then we have Figgy and Marino, part 57. Uh, and then we have a vacant title. So not necessarily will a champion be losing it. So put that off to the side. I just wanted to stress that to the fans. Um, but any thoughts there goes, how about you? You, can you think of someone maybe I'm not thinking of? Um, I don't know exactly early part, but I feel like the, the guy that's got that target on his back right now is Alex Pereira. I feel like he's Israel out of kryptonite, but the rest of the division might be his, you know, just because you see the deficiencies on the ground. 
Um, I think there are better fighters that could take advantage of that those areas. So I think his title won't be around his waist that long. All right. How about you, Nolan? Yeah, Pereira's one. I mean, obviously, you got two champions right now that were losing their fight until they won it. Um, and the other one's Leon Edwards. Uh, you know, if him and Usman fight again, I have a tough time in my head thinking after seeing how the round the rounds played out before the head kick that Leon would be able to, unless he lands another shot like that. I mean, nobody saw it coming to begin with. So in my head, that's another one. I think Leon's kind of, uh, you know, I'm not saying he can't do it. He obviously did it once, but I have a tough time buying into a successful defense against Usman if they fight again. Man, good thing you aren't the writer for the Rocky movies because he did lose one, but he won two and then three, and you're saying he gets shut out in three. Okay. How about you, Mike Bond? I think these guys pretty much nailed it with the uh, top two. I guess just to throw another one out there, uh, maybe Zhang Wali. I mean, you have a sitting champion there who has two losses to a contender in Rose Namajunas. So uh, I don't know if that fight's going to be made in 2023. Maybe it doesn't happen. Maybe the UFC uh, wants to create some distance there and try to run that third fight some point down the line. But if Rose and Zhang Wali get in the cage together at some point again, over these next 12 months, I mean, you would have to expect that Rose Namajunas would be the favorite. So um, I think that's another one that we must note. And then there's just, to, I mean, we're naming them all now, but just to, the one that always keeps me guessing too, I mean, Figueredo versus Moreno, four, like we've seen that fight play out three different ways. So uh, maybe maybe four has something, um, you know, flipping back in the Moreno side for us. Maybe we'll see a fifth one. And could see that 205 pound belt, yeah, maybe being passed around two or three times, depending on how many title fights there are. It's entirely possible, you know, if Glover Teixeira wins, he vacates the title and retires. And who knows? There's a lot of instances that 205 uh, division could go. Nobody's giving Fader a shot. I definitely give him a shot. Okay. I mean, he looks. He looks. Arguably That's all he's got, though. A yeah. little shot. Right. I mean, he's he's looked. <laughs> he looked great that last fight, great. but. Eh. Was I just keep thinking of him going down against Bader the first time. You know? Yeah. My my rule is anytime a fighter has the same physique as me, it's probably not going to go that well. <laughs> hey, don't give yourself that much credit, Ghost. Come on. <laughs>